Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the natural family planning conversation. I'm your host, Ellen Holloway. All right, everybody, we are here with Trisha today. Trisha is going to share with us um, her NFP journey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your story. Well, my name's Trisha, and um, my husband and I met in 2007, got married in 2012, and then decided in 2017 that we were going to start trying for a baby. We have done NFP our entire marriage. I learned the Billings ovulation method. Um, and, and then I did that the whole time. I didn't even know that there were other methods until kind of recent ish. I feel like probably somewhere along in the infertility journey is when I started to learn that, oh, like there's more than one. I, I sort of just <laughs> thought there was one method and I was doing it. Yeah. You um, are not, not alone right. in that thought. I think a lot of us, I mean, that was myself. I learned a symptothermal method and that I thought that that was NFP. <laughs> like, yeah. Same. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys started trying, um, to have a baby and then, um, and then it didn't happen immediately. Exactly. So by January of 2018, we still were not pregnant. Um, I know they say that it can take up to a year, but I also felt like I didn't want to wait a year to seek help because, um, I, I knew from the tracking that it wasn't an issue with timing. So it felt like it could be something else. I was hopeful that it was nothing and that we just needed more time, but I had called, I called an infertility clinic near our home at that time in January. Before that appointment, I had started reading, taking charge of your fertility. And in that I realized, I thought that I, or I suspected that I might have a luteal phase defect. So, um, my luteal phase was always, it was pretty irregular and it never was a full two weeks. It could be nine days. It could be 10, 11, but it always shifted, mm-hmm. um, where my ovulation didn't. And so I definitely suspected that. And I wanted to talk about that when we went in for our infertility consult. So we go, we go in for this consult. I brought my charts. I brought up the luteal phase defect. I explained that we had been doing NFP for X amount of years And I asked what, you know, if if I have that, what can we do? And I was really brushed off. Um, That's so frustrating. Like, yeah, it's so frustrating. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She told me that, you know, they're not really sure if like a luteal phase defect is really a thing that like affects your ability to get pregnant. And this is a fertility clinic that's saying, yeah, a a conventional (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Conventional fertility clinic. Oh my yep. goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she's telling me that. And then she's telling, and then she's telling me if we do suspect that that's the issue, we would give you Clomid to help you ovulate earlier in the hopes that your luteal phase would be longer, which <laughs> now after everything I've learned makes no sense at all, because once you ovulate the you know, the hormonal process of your luteal, like, is it, is in process? Like it's not, it, that is not affected by the day of your cycle that you ovulate. Right. Moving, moving ovulation up is not going to change how long your luteal phase is. You have an issue with the hormones going on in the luteal phase, not in the earlier phases of your cycle. So moving, moving ovulation is going to do nothing for a luteal phase problem. And I thought that was weird, but I honestly, at that time, I didn't question it because I wasn't, you know, I'm looking to this clinic, they're the experts and I'm really kind of defaulting to whatever they think. And I didn't quite know yet how to advocate for myself. And, Mm -hmm. um, cause I, and also I really hoped that it wasn't the problem, that there was no problem. So, you know, I'm not sitting there thinking like, this makes no sense. I'm like, okay, whatever. That's this, this is it. This is it. So, um, they decided to do some testing on me and my husband. So I had some blood work done to check my hormones. Um, she really didn't even look at my charting or anything like that. She had no, nothing. She didn't know what to do with that. Um, let's just pause really quick. Cause I do know the end of her story. Um, and we'll get to it in a little while, but the fact that they did testing on your hormone levels, um, they did blood work mm-hmm. on you and didn't really mm-hmm. find anything initially that goes to show the importance of doing 
hormone blood work on specific days of your cycle, depending on when you ovulate it. So just, I'm just throwing that out there, guys. It's actually really important. Exactly. Exactly. So I do the blood test and that comes back normal. They have my husband do a sperm analysis, which again, because this is a conventional clinic was done, you know, via masturbation, um, which we didn't feel great about, but it was kind of like, I just, we just sort of thought that this is how it's done. Like there is no other way, which we later learned that there is a different way through NAPRO. Um, They have um, the perforated condoms that can collect the um, sperm sample through the process of intercourse by using this like perforated condom. So you're not um, preventing anything, but you're still like collecting. Um, Right. And there's um, some episodes that we did with uh, Melissa Bucken, the implications of IVF episodes that are a couple episodes back. Um, And she does talk about that her uh, fertility clinic um, that she runs has um, that option available. So go back and look at those episodes and the links in those episodes. um, If you are curious and want to know more about this perforated condom and options along those lines. Yeah. So, but for the early stages of our infertility journey, um, we just, I I don't, I never heard of that. I didn't even need that was a thing. And we just were like, okay, we just have to do whatever we have to do to find this information and it's medically necessary. So it is what it is. And at that point, um, we found that his sperm counts were low, lower than normal. They were not within normal range and all consideration of my luteal phase, any hormone issues that I might be having, like were out the window, the clinic called said he has this low sperm count. And they said, this is it. This is what's preventing um, you from being able to get pregnant. And I asked again, like, well, are we sure? Like there's nothing wrong with my luteal phase or it couldn't be whatever. And they were like, no, this is it. And so I said, okay. And um, we were referred to the male factor infertility specialist within that clinic. He recommended some supplements that we could try. Um, and then, you know, told us to come back. So we saw the urologist and determined that my husband had a grade one varicocele. And if, um, you're not familiar with what a varicocele is, but it's, um, it's kind of like the equivalent of a varicose vein in the testicle. And so it's like this expanded vein that's getting a lot of blood flow, which causes a lot of heat. And so the temperature isn't regulated well, um, in the te- near the testicles is causing it to be too hot. And we know that, um, you, you, they need, you know, you need temperature control in order to have a normal sperm count and production and all of those things. Right. And so the doctor found that it was a grade one, which, um, as you explained to me, Trisha, there's kind of like three different levels, um, level, mm-hmm. the, the first level being the lowest, Um, Mm -hmm. and so that it would, that would affect his sperm count the least basically is, is kind of the idea. So if you have a grade three, it's going to really affect the sperm count. If you have a grade one, it might not even be the reason why he has low sperm count. Exactly. So when we went back to the, the male factor and fertility specialist, after determining he has the grade one varicocele, and when they're a lower grade like this, a lot of times treating them doesn't result doesn't result in any better, um, like sperm testing outcomes that, um, you could, you know, the way to treat it is to surgically correct it. Um, and he sort of, he really scared us off of that basically. Um, because he mentioned that if it's not done like properly and if blood somehow it's like blood or something escapes, I think blood escapes Mm -hmm. or leaks or something that it could cause the body to create antibodies against the sperm. And then the sperm count will actually drop even more, which really, I mean, there's, there's always risk when you go in for a surgery. Right. And so at that time you guys determined, you know, okay, let's, let's not try to fix this because it's this level one. Um, so it, it might not even make a difference. And so, um, so where did you, where did you turn next? What happened next? (laughs) Yeah. So the only thing the clinic could offer us was either doing IUI, which is interuterine insemination or IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. Um, the male factor and fertility doctor, he basically told us like, you're not going to be able to get pregnant without IVF. We felt like IVF 
was never really on the table, although there definitely were some moments of desperation where we, I don't want to say considered it because we never really considered it in earnest, but we would kind of speak to each other like, I don't know, is this possible? And, but sure. we never really, we never ended up crossing that line. Um, but for us, we knew the church was teaching on it. And I felt so uneasy um, with the idea of creating multiple embryos and then mm-hmm. not knowing how many you would get and having them, having to make a decision to either store them forever, destroy them or donate them. Um, because to me, that's a life. Yeah. So, so that, that creation of additional lives is, is one of the biggest factors of IVF that can, um, yeah, bring up all those questions and things like that. And so what you had said to me before that, like IUI sort of felt like a little bit less of a moral issue. Like it was, it was like the lesser of the two evils sort of a thing. Well, so I did look up the church's teachings on IUI and I was quite surprised to find that it wasn't technically allowed. Um, Mm -hmm. I, it, I guess I felt like abandoned by the church. Like I, like I'm having these issues. I'm looking for answers. And what are they giving me? They're, sh- they're giving me no, they're telling mm-hmm. me no over and over. And as far, and at this time, all I know that are my available options are IUI or IVF. I'm not yet familiar with NAPRO or that there could be any hope outside of these two treatments. And when you Google infertility and you Google treatments or options, NAPRO doesn't come up anywhere unless you're specifically searching Catholic infertility, like help or NAPRO or something like that. Um, it will not come up. Um, so at that point I felt like these are my two options. I know that IVF is a no go. I don't feel great necessarily about IUI, but we really want to have a baby. We prayed about it. I believed at that time and that God gave me the green light that yes, like you're going to have a family. And so it just sort of felt like I didn't really have a choice, which Mm -hmm. obviously I did. And I could still have chosen to say no, but you know, we didn't, we, by this time we had been trying for over a year. This clinic is telling us that, you know, we can't get pregnant without IVF. We definitely know we don't want to do that. We're just feeling very devastated and defeated. And so we feel like, you know what, um, we're just, we're just going to try a round of IUI and the clinic wasn't even super confident that IUI could be beneficial for us, but we, um, we could afford it and we just felt like it was all we had. Um, sure. Yeah. So you guys went into the clinic to do IUI and the Mm -hmm. first time you did it, um, his sperm sample didn't even have any viable sperm. Is that, is that right? That's correct. So we, my ovulation had happened a little sooner than it normally did that month. And so we were like, we could still try on our own and do the IUI. And I got a positive OPK and then they were like, okay, you got to come in and do the IUI. And there was nothing, um, because he had such low sperm count. And then because we had had intercourse, it, there was just like nothing there. Um, and, but that was, that was devastating because that is not normal like that. Just because you have sex, doesn't mean that the next time there would, there should be nothing in there. Um, and so that was really, you know, we're going there and yes, we have some reservations about it, but also we're like really hopeful that like, maybe this is it, maybe we're going to walk out and like, I'm going to be pregnant and our baby's coming. And then we were sitting in the waiting room and I remember her coming to get us. And I said, like, we can't do it because there was nothing. And I just remember bawling my eyes out when we left the clinic and I'm pretty sure I was supposed to go back to work or something. And I mm-hmm. called, I just was like, I can't come in. And, um, so Definitely. the month after that, we tried IUI again. And this time there was some sperm in his sample, but very, very little. Um, to the point where they kind of were like, we'll give you the option. If you want to do it, you can, but there's pretty much not very much in here, but we're only looking at like a small portion, you know, and it only takes one. And, you know, they were kind of like not saying don't do it, but not saying yes, do it. It was very like, you can do it if you want to, who knows miracles can happen, but it's not likely. Right. Um, and we just decided to do it because we were, we were there and, um, that uh, didn't work either. So after this, we're kind of like, okay, well, what do we do now? Because we feel like we don't really have anywhere to turn. 
Um, although my husband had been looking into varicocele repair on his own and researching that and really wanting that. And he kept bringing that up to me and I kept pushing him off because that doctor had scared me Mm -hmm. at the idea of doing the repair, but he really felt like we needed to explore this option. And so eventually I said, okay, his last semen analysis before um, the surgeries, he had less than a million. And for anyone who's not familiar, normal is between 15 and 32 million, I think, but most men have like 80 million or 70 million. And his was his last one before the repair was under a million. And wow. a lot of the other parameters that they check, like morphology and motility, like they don't even run those when it's so low. Sure. This seems like the right next step. And so we decided to do it. And it's like an outpatient surgery. He did have to be put under, but we, I just took him to the surgery center and then took him home. And, um, after his surgery, I was in the waiting room, doc, the doctor comes out and he sits down next to me and he like takes his scrub cap off and he's like kind of shaking his head. And he says to me, I'm so glad you decided to do the surgery because when we got in there, your husband is very vascular. Like his anatomy is very vascular and what felt like externally to be a grade one once he like got eyes on it, it was more, he thought a grade two, maybe even a grade three. Wow. Yes. And I asked him, okay, so does that mean our, the chances for improvement are greater because the grade level was probably worse than what we thought. And he said, yes, um, he couldn't promise that it would get back to a normal range necessarily, but he thought that there was a better chance that we could see a bigger jump in his sperm count numbers. Sure. Um, after six more months, six or more months of trying, I started seeing a therapist in July of 2019. And I specifically chose a Christian group. Um, I just wanted someone who was on my same faith page. Cause I knew that that was a big part of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I had a lot of anger towards God. Um, at that time, my faith wasn't something that was carrying me through. I felt like my faith was crumbling a little bit under the weight of all of this. And, um, uh, to say that she changed my life would be an understatement. The first time I saw her, I started telling her my story and I really kind of went in there just like, you know, I just need some coping mechanisms. Like I'm not handling this well. And I come to find out that she's Catholic herself and that she had suffered with infertility. And now this is just someone I picked off of the webpage. There was nothing in her bio about her being Catholic or her dealing with anything infertility specific. Like, so I know that God put me with her. Yeah. He's like very specifically chose her to be your therapist. That's just beautiful. She um, shares with me at that visit that she had gone through like years of infertility that she went on to have four children and that she's Catholic herself. And I left feeling so much lighter. Like I knew I still had a long road ahead, but I left feeling so much better. And I, like, I had some hope for the first time in a long time. And I thought I was going to her for just help with coping, but really she helped me so much more with reconnecting with my faith through the ways that she helped me reconnect with my faith. I learned about NAPRO. And so I started to dig a little deeper into what NAPRO is. So I made an appointment with a conventional clinic, and then I had made an appointment with a couple of NAPRO providers. The NAPRO providers were scheduling really far out, but there was a little family medicine practice right near my home. They do some NAPRO stuff. They don't treat um, the couple. They just treat the woman. Like they can mm-hmm. help you with your charting and like troubleshooting your charts. Um, so I, I did call and I asked to make an appointment and I had to go through their Creighton method class before I could get the appointment. And I was a little salty about that because I had been doing billings for (laughs) years and I felt like, just give me the Creighton handbook. I don't need the class. I just need you to tell me how you want me to notate my, uh, fertility signs and I'll do that. Like, I already know how to find them. I already know they're there. (laughs) Um, but I had, they made me do the class. And so I do the class and then they wouldn't let me make an appointment for NAPRO, I think until you charted for either like a month or two months. And at this point, we've been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years. And I mean, that just every single month extra that you have to wait feels like torture. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, you know, I was salty about that too, but I was like, okay, whatever that's sooner than the other doctor. So I'll just, I have to take what I can get. And I was in the middle of saying a novena to St. Therese and 
I got a call from that clinic that the person I was supposed to see had to take an unexpected leave and I needed to reschedule. And when I explained what I was needing to be seen for, they were like, oh, well, you can just see so-and-so like next week. And so <laughs> I obviously I jumped on that appointment and I went in and she, I think she's a nurse practitioner who, who does NAPRO and, um, we, I brought my charts and she took me seriously about my, about my short luteal phase. Finally. Someone. Yay. Yes, yes, yes. And so, um, she orders blood work for me. And so we did that and we determined that my progesterone was dropping off too soon and that I truly did have a luteal phase defect. And uh, man, it felt so good to have somebody take it seriously. And I also yes. felt so frustrated that years prior, um, you know, it got brushed off and I knew it this entire time, but I questioned myself, I doubted myself and I didn't have the tools that I had now to know who to go to, who could help me. Right. But I was glad to be getting help. And so she recommended doing HCG injections. Um, there's a couple ways that you can treat luteal phase defects. Um, but we did, we started the injections after doing that for a little while, we transitioned over to the care of a different doctor in this area who's a NAPRO provider. And he also does like surgical procedures Mm -hmm. um, because he would do the testing and the treating of my husband. Whereas little flower was just treating me. They really couldn't like, they didn't do anything surgical. They didn't do anything with treating your spouse. Um, And before I had actually seen her, I'm skipping back a little bit, but when I first learned about NAPRO, I looked into it and a lot of it was very much um, like most of the information that you find relates to PCOS and endometriosis and right. how they can do these surgical procedures to treat those conditions or help treat those conditions. Um, and so I really went into NAPRO feeling kind of like, mm, I don't know if this is going to help us because I, as far as I know, these have been ruled out. I don't have PCOS. I don't have endometriosis. That's mm-hmm. not my issue. Like what about people who are having infertility that's not caused by those conditions? Is NAPRO still appropriate? And I thought the answer was going to be no, it is not. The answer is Yes. If you're having infertility issues and you don't have endo, you don't have PCOS, you can still see a NAPRO provider and they can help you. Um, So we transitioned over to a doctor who was associated with a bigger medical hospital here and he was able to treat us both. He did. He wanted to retest my husband. Um, Before I could see the NAPRO provider, we did follow up with a traditional clinic here. At that point, I was feeling pretty confident that we weren't going to utilize any services there with a traditional clinic, but we still thought we have to get my husband's sperm rechecked it, rechecked. Um, We have to do the analysis. And so can we, you know, we just thought we need to go to a traditional clinic to do that. Um, And so we went there and they retested him. And when they called to give us those results, um, she says, okay, so I have his results here and everything looks normal. And you would think that I would be overjoyed, but actually my first feeling was this flash of like very intense anger because I was convinced that she called the wrong person Yeah, because he had never, never had a normal test ever. He, I said, he's never had a normal result. Like, can you like check? Are you, did you call the right person? Do you have the right patient file? Like, his last reading was under a million, his last count. And now you're telling me that he's normal. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean by normal? And she looked back and she was said, and she said, Oh, wow. Like when she saw his previous one, she's like, yeah, that, yeah, he did. She's like, um, no, like I have the right one and it's normal. Like it's 30 million or something. And in that we had a huge feeling of elation and like a weight had been lifted, but then we also felt like, well, if this is the new result, then why are we still not pregnant? What is the problem then? If this isn't the problem anymore. Yeah. That's when seeing NAPRO, um, really, really like changed everything and taking my LP seriously. Um, because we knew then that it must've had to do something with me. Right. Right. Yeah. So when you got transitioned over to the NAPRO doctor then yes, and the surgeon, um, yes, the surgeon. Yeah. So you had been working on the LP problem for what a couple of cycles now. 
Um, yes. Doing the HCG injections. Um, and then we transitioned out to his care, um, doctor, um, put off and he, we went in for a consult with him. And I just remember being like, so nervous because I didn't want to get any negative news, um, but also feeling really hopeful. And so in his office was so wonderful. He was so kind. He took so much time with us. He answered all of our questions. Um, so we saw him and he wanted to retest my husband's sperm counts. And then this is when we learned about using the perforated condom. And we kind of questioned like, how accurate is this? Uh, but it is, it's accurate. Um, great normal ranges. Um, he, we went over my treatment plan. I ex- told him that I was still doing, that I was doing the HCG injections. I asked him if he wanted me to continue doing that. And if he would take over prescribing that. And he did, he felt like that was the way to go. And so really like he left no stone unturned and the things that he was asking and the things that he was testing for, none of the conventional clinics were asking me about this or even bringing this up or talking about it. So it was pretty amazing. It was really amazing. And, you know, we asked him now that we've had this retesting done, now that I've had all this testing done, because I also had done like the thing where they flush your tubes and mm. they do the saline in your uterus. The um, traditional clinic had ordered those to rule out any like um, physical issues that maybe I might have with like a block tube or anything like that. Um, so, you know, we really went to him with everything and we asked him like, what do you, what do you think our chances are? And he told us that he thought we had a 70 to 80% chance. Fabulous. So this was like a huge, huge difference from two, two and a half years prior of being told you have no chance and you have to do IVF. And that also gets me so fired up because how many couples are being told you have no chance, you have to do IVF and they're believing it because why wouldn't you? Because I believed it because I thought this doctor, you know, I'm looking to him as the expert and he I'm sure truly believes what he's saying. He probably believes that that's true too. So I'm not hating on him, you know, but how many couples are told this and go down a road that for whatever reason, they don't want to go down and maybe they didn't need that at all. Like, I would really love to know. I I don't know that we can ever really know, but, um, so that really, that really gets me fired up. And I will tell anybody who wants to listen about NAPRO, um, you do not have to be Catholic. I know your audience is probably mostly Catholic, but you do not have to be Catholic in order to see a NAPRO provider. It's just the Catholics who seem to know about it. And like, <laughs> nobody else seems to know. It just shocks me that even when you, like, even in fertility, like um, support groups and like Facebook groups or whatever that are on social media and on the internet, like when you're looking for people's stories, you know, like when you're going through infertility, right. you're looking for other people's stories that kind of mirror yours that have a happy ending to give you some kind of hope. Right. In all of those stories, I never once saw anything about NAPRO. All right. So tell us your happy ending. <laughs> okay. So, um, we needed to do the HCD injections for six months. It was on the sixth cycle that, um, we, that we got pregnant. Um, you have to wait until day 17 post like ovulation, um, to do a pregnancy test because the HCG from the medication will give you a false positive. Right. Because HCG is what, you know, an at-home pregnancy test is testing for. (laughs) Yes. And then, you know, it's day like 16 and we're getting ready for bed and I still don't have my period. And I'm like super scared that I'm going to get it like overnight because that had happened to me a previous cycle. And I like, don't want to get my hopes up, but I know I've never made it this far before. And that morning, um, I took the test and the whole time I'm doing that, I'm thinking, my period's going to start right now. Like, I just know it. I know it. It's just going to happen. It's going to like happen. It's going to happen. But no, I mean, it was positive. I said it, I dipped it and I set it down and it lit up positive, like right away. And we just like, couldn't believe it. They have you come in at, um, eight weeks to do an internal ultrasound. My, that really made it real for my husband. We left and he was like, whoa, like this is happening. And I was still like in shock. Like, I think I'm still in shock. Like even now when my baby's like 10 months old, I, I just was <laughs> like, 
is this real? I just, I can't even believe it. That's awesome. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Trisha. We are going to do a follow-up episode. Um, so check that out next week. We're going to be talking a little bit more about, um, you know, the religious side of the story and what was going on, um, and, and where God's hand was really working, um, in some of these different aspects, uh, of her story. I also want to mention that um, if this is something that you're struggling with, if some of the church teachings on things like IVF or IUI um, are something that you're you're not really sure about, um, these are really great things that I would love to discuss with you in coaching. Um, as a couple of episodes ago, I did an episode with Emily Frazee where we talked about the NFP mindset coaching that I do. And um, that is, you know, these are the kinds of things, these are the kind of conversations that I have in coaching. And so I would love to see you there. If you, or even if someone, you know, you can, um, send this episode or my information their way. If you're not following us on Instagram, be sure to check us out at charting toward intimacy. And if you want to reach out to me, be sure to uh, send me an email or reach out to me on Instagram until next time.